Okay. What's up, guys? What's going on? All right. How you guys doing? How you guys doing? Yeah, pray for me, guys. It's hard to get your muscles back, but by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to get my muscles back, my health back. But anyway, good to see you. Hope the screen is doing is okay. Let's see. Do I need it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that should be good. That should be good. But you got to admit, I am beautiful. All right? Good to see you guys. All right. Hold on. Yes? Hello? What's going on? Where are you guys at? Yes. Who? What who? Okay. Let me call you back because I'm live stream right now. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Sorry, guys. I had to take that call. All right. What's going on, everybody? So how are you guys? Are you guys okay? Don't worry. I'm going to get my muscles back. Pray for me. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. All right. Well, we're just waiting. Our arbiter is here, our brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, thank him for helping me to help you, serving me to serve you because he posts Bible verses for me. And we got a couple of regulars. We got Renee. Renee, Renee. I can't sing that song. I was going to say, Renee, Renee, I'm in love with you. But that. That wouldn't be the case. And we got Idiotai Apologetics. He's a dear brother in Christ. In fact, what I want you to do is Idiotai is an up-and-coming apologist who loves Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'm going to be his guest in a week. I want you to go to his YouTube channel, like his YouTube channel, right, and pray for him and encourage him that he starts producing more materials for the glory of Jesus Christ. And Orbiter also has a YouTube account. Orbiter also has a YouTube account. Orbiter, tell them what your YouTube account is because I want you to subscribe to his YouTube and like the videos as well and watch because these are all brothers who love Jesus Christ and are doing all they can to advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ, to glorify Jesus Christ and serve the brethren. Protestant believer, so go there. Why do I keep calling you Protestant reformer? <laughs> all right. Okay. So let's help Idiotai. Right? Sorry about that. Coffee. And let's encourage other brothers and pray. As we're waiting for more people to show up, pray for me. That the Holy Spirit will fill me for the glory of Jesus Christ. I was asked a question yesterday and then in the comments. How do I adjust John chapter 6 verse 53? It's a passage used to prove the doctrine of transubstanti transubstantiation and or consubstantiation. So by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll get into these topics. They're going to be controversial because I know I'm going to offend both Protestants and those from apostolic traditions. When I say apostolic traditions, I mean the Roman Catholic tradition, the Orthodox tradition, the Coptic tradition. And I'm not trying to be unnecessarily offensive, but I'm trying to be faithful to my understanding of Scripture. And I'm fallible and imperfect, right? But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me and sanctify me and transform me, transform the way I think so that I can think God's thoughts after God and give me the power to live for the glory of Jesus and to love Jesus Christ and be in love with Jesus Christ. And I fail. Brethren, I fail daily. I have struggles. I have desires. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to mortify my flesh and save me, especially from external trials, trials beyond my control. So pray for me. Pray for my angels, my two daughters whom I love and adore, and pray for their mother that God will convict her and bless her and save her for the glory of Jesus, right? Okay, so, but before I begin, <clears throat> I'll just wait a few more minutes until we get more of the regulars to show up. So you can ask me a question, and when I'm about to begin, I'll start in a word of prayer, begging the Holy Spirit to fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I love my girls. The two greatest gifts after knowing Jesus Christ the greatest gift is to be known by the triune God, to be loved by Jesus and in love with Jesus Christ. But the two greatest gifts after my Lord Jesus are my daughters. I love them. And I know Jesus loves them, will fight for them and protect them as he's protecting me. Kay Johnson, let's see what your question is. Let's see what your question is. 
Yeah, you mean the oneness, right? Yeah, Renee. Renee is also a fire breathing warrior, a dragoness, sanctified one. Yeah, I have to begin in prayer. And it's not because I'm trying to impress people. I pray because from my heart, and I pray God purifies my heart and gives me the heart of Jesus Christ. I pray from my heart because I need the Holy Spirit to anoint me to speak truth without error and also to give me the power, the power to live for the glory of Jesus. Because the most important thing to the Lord is not just to know his word, but to live it. And I'm a failure, and may God have mercy on me. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Please pray for me. If you love me for the sake of Jesus, pray for me that I can walk the walk and obey the Lord. Good question, Kay Johnson. Would it be safe to say that the triune God is three spirits? See, before I answer the question, you always have to define what you mean by spirit. If you're referring to spirit as a spiritual person, a person that is spirit, yes, there are three spirits. But if you mean spirit in the sense that the nature of God is spirit, and by spirit you mean that God is bodiless, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, non-physical, then if you're referring to God's nature as spirit, then there's only one spirit because there's only one nature. Okay, right. Sorry, guys. Pray for the internet connectivity, right? In Jesus' name, may it be smooth. Okay, let me repeat that again. Okay, Johnson, it depends on what you mean by spirit. If you're defining spirit in regards to personhood, personality, a spiritual person, right? Spirit in the sense that the Father is a person who is not a flesh and blood human being, then, yeah, you can say three spirits. But if you're using the term spirit to refer to the nature of God, what God is like, there's only one nature of God, so it's only one spirit. So it goes back to how are you using the term spirit? You with me there, Kay Johnson? I don't know what you mean, Barack O'Neill. Oh, any signs of the sun and the flood of Noah? I don't know. I don't know what you're asking me to be to be quite honest. What do you mean, signs of the sun and the flood of Noah? Can you be more specific? Everything points to Jesus Christ. So I don't know what you're asking. So Kay Johnson, did that help? May the Lord Jesus anoint us and beatify me the beauty of Jesus. So it depends on you define the term, you know, spirit. If you're using spirit in a sense as person, then there are three spirits. But if you're using spirit in regards to the nature of God, that God's nature is spirit. Because when we say God is spirit, what we mean is that his nature is <clears throat> distinct from creation. He's timeless. He's spaceless. He's not physical. He's not material. How you doing, Michael Deke? Sal, how you doing? Everyone, welcome. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, the ark itself, the ark itself becomes a picture of the body of Christ and that it's the body of Christ that saves us, right? So you have to be in union with Christ. You have to enter the ark, right? <clears throat> and the ark becomes your covering, your shield, your, your protection, right? Peter himself uses the floodwaters as a type, a picture of our baptism, being united to Christ and being raised with him. First Peter chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. But I'll try to get into that a little deeper, a little later if I have time. Just waiting for a few more minutes. Any other questions before I begin in prayer? Come on, choose Jesus. Anything that will... How do I say this? Anything that you become addicted to, enslaved to, Anything that will affect your cog cognitive abilities, right, is no good. So if smoking weed, apart from its medicinal benefits, like, for example, cancer patients, if you're smoking weed and it affects your cognitive abilities, right, where <clears throat> you're not sober-minded, then it's no good. And if you become enslaved to it, it's no good. So it depends on the purpose. Are you smoking weed for medicinal reasons? Because there are cancer patients that need that because it helps them cope with the pain. Well, that's all right. And there are other medicinal effects of, of smoking weed. But most people don't smoke it for its medicinal benefits. They just smoke it because they enjoy having their cognitive abilities dampened, for lack of a better term. Right? 
It's the purpose. And, and, and again, that's even like eating. When you eat, do you gorge yourself? Well, that's sin. That's gluttony. You are to enjoy food, but you're not to be enslaved by food. And food is not to control your life and dictate your life. Right? Because whatever God has created, it is created for good, but it can be misused for bad and evil. Even sexual intimacy, right? Even sexual intimacy. That's a gift that God gave for the male and female to become one in holy matrimony. But we take that gift and now we abuse it and use it for evil. So I hope that answered the question. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and protect me from error because I don't want to misinform you. As long as you're not enslaved by anything other than the triune God, as long as you're not controlled by anything other than the triune God, right, and you're not abusing it, then there is a benefit in most everything in creation. But we have to also take into consideration after the fall, that which was initially good, all creation was good, has been affected and corrupted by sin, by evil, and by Satan and the kingdom of darkness. So creation is not in the condition, in the state that it initially was when God created it good. Good, another good question. Mom asked me another good question. Okay, usually we get over 100. Now, you guys got to pray that God will bless this channel, help me blow it up so we can get over 1,000 watching. Man, if David Wood can do it and CP can do it, I can do it for the glory of Jesus and pray that the Lord will purify my motives that I'm doing it for the right reason. Right? All right. We're almost going to begin. This is all a warm-up. I hope the gentleman that asked me about John 6.53 is here. Bless you too, Glenn. No, the problem with Super Chat, uh, Clara, I know David Wood likes it and Christian Prince. To be honest, I was told by David Wood that they take 50% of all your donations. You know that, right? So let's say you give 50, they take 25. I think that's highway robbery, don't you? See, when you say yes, at least 90% of the Holy Saints were Catholic, that's misleading. They were not Roman Catholic. They were Catholic in the sense that they believed the church was universal and located over, all over the world because the word Catholicos means universal. And love life. You need to be careful and not speak presumptuously because there are Orthodox, like yesterday, there are Orthodox in my channel saying the Roman Catholic Church has corrupted its way, fallen from the pure apostolic teaching, whereas the Orthodox has maintained pure apostolic doctrine. So let's not get into that debate. Let's be humble, right? Let's agree to disagree, and let's focus on the issues here. Thank you. Alpha and Omega, here's an Orthodox. Would you agree with Love Life that 90% of the early church fathers were Catholic, meaning Roman Catholic? Of course you don't. Of course you don't, right? See? See? Now let me tell you. I believe there are true believers, born-again believers, spirit-filled believers from every major branch of Christianity. And in this, <clears throat> I disagree with many of my brothers and sisters from the Reformed tradition who may think I'm compromised, but that's my position. You see, so here we have a brother, a Syrian brother, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. He's my brother. He's a Syrian. He's Chaldean, right? He's going to tell me the Roman Catholic Church is a true church that Jesus established. The Orthodox is going to tell me that the Orthodox Church is a true church that Jesus established. Because at one point in history, the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics were one until the Great Schism in 1054. So I don't want to get into these issues because, believe it or not, appealing to the fathers doesn't solve the problem. It actually creates more problems because the Orthodox will appeal to the same fathers that the Roman Catholics do to prove that they have maintained the pure apostolic teaching more so than the Roman Catholics who fell away and vice versa. So let's just focus on the things we can agree on. And I'm going to say things that my Roman Catholic brothers, my Orthodox brothers and sisters are not going to like. And I'm going to say things that the Catholics, I mean, the Protestants won't like. But I want to be clear. And before I begin, I want to be clear. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. I don't. I want to love on you and teach you for the glory of Jesus as long as the Holy Spirit uses me for the glory of Jesus because the Holy Spirit doesn't need me. I'm expendable, right? But at the same time, I don't like to be challenged. I don't like to be attacked. 
because I'm not here to debate you. So don't come here to debate me and try to prove I'm wrong. Because let's say you prove I'm wrong. So what? Listen to me for a second because I want to benefit you. I'm here to serve you. I'm your servant for the sake of Jesus. Honestly, I am. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. And thank our brother Orbiter. He'll post it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. I want to model this passage. I want to be like Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit who tried to be like Jesus. You will benefit from me if you just come and listen. Take what I have to say and go back and study it. And where you see I'm wrong, then reject it. But if you come here to debate and challenge me, I'm a wicked, sinful, arrogant, proud human being who needs the blood of Jesus to cleanse me and the Holy Spirit to transform me. I'm not a saint. I'm not perfect. I have issues. And the guy who has the most issues is Sahih Christian. Sahih Christian, that guy can make a strong case of leaving Christianity to become Muslim. No, I'm just kidding. By the way, Sahih Christian is one of my best friends, and he's a dear brother to my heart. And Sahih Christian and me are going through some trials, aren't we? Only God can save him and me from our trials. <laughs> Sahih, should I cry or laugh? Should I cry or laugh? I don't know if I'm crying or laughing. Only God can save him and me for what we're going through, honestly. Right? Now, here's where you're going to learn from me and benefit from me. Don't debate me. Even if you think I'm wrong, take what I have to say, go back and study it, trust Holy Spirit to guide you as I'm trusting him to guide me, and say, well, Sam is wrong here, but I accept the things where he's right. Because that's what I do with every tradition. I've learned a lot from Roman Catholics, from Orthodox. I've even learned a lot from Arian heretics and Unitarians. Whatever is true, I accept. Whatever is false, I reject. So if you want to get the most out of these sessions, don't fight me. Don't debate me. Don't challenge me. Like Aunt Tracy yesterday, quote, unquote, attacked me. And when I went after her, another guy, resurrected eyes, was offended. Oh, man, you're harsh with her. Well, what do you expect? Right? No, you're not. We're just beginning. Now, that said, let me begin in prayer. Are we ready? Pray we get close to 200 for the glory of Jesus. Are you ready for me to pray? Let's pray. Okay. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we bless you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. Lord Jesus, we bless you. We praise you. We love you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, we bless you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. Father, for the sake of the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus, anoint this session. Anoint me. Anoint everyone who's present. Fill us with the Spirit. Fill me with the Spirit. And Father, grant me clarity of thought and speech and save me from confusion and error. And bless your people with power from your spirit to understand the things I say. And Father, I pray that through this session, you will cause Jesus Christ to increase in us. Give us the power. Give me the power to live more like Jesus, to be more in love with Jesus, and to trust Jesus more. And Father, please save us from our calamities. Save us from our own flesh. Save us from our child. Save us from the evil one. And save our loved ones. In my case, my daughters, even their mother. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Fill my body and my lungs and my throat with the breath of life, giving me the health I need to glorify you, Father, and to bless your people. Please, Father, take over this session and have your way. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Use me for the glory of Christ. Please, glorious Spirit, and seal us for Christ, because apart from you, we cannot live for the glory of Jesus. And we depend on you in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. All right. I'm talking about two controversial topics. Now, for my Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Coptic, Nestorian brothers and sisters, please don't get angry with me. Don't attack me. Even if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Hear me out. Are you with me? I'm going to interpret John 6, 53 to the best of my ability. And I, you're going to disagree with me, I know. But where the Protestants are going to disagree with me is on the communion of saints. So I'm going to offend all of you. But hear me out. Don't attack me. You don't agree with me, that's okay. Okay, I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, even if you win a debate against me, let me repeat. So what? Am I someone special? It's like when people challenge me, I challenge you to debate. Okay, so you crush me. Oh, wow. You know what would be impressive? If you could debate the Apostle Paul and refute him, which would never happen. 
because Paul was filled with power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus worked through him, right? In a way that he doesn't work through us because I believe they had a special charism, a special blessing we don't have, right? So just want to make sure because I don't want to offend you guys, but at the same time, I don't want to be offended either, right? I'm asked about the interpretation of John 6, 53. Do I take this to mean that you are to physically ingest the Lord Jesus Christ sacramentally? Okay, now, if you guys want to benefit, focus on the passages. Orbert is going to post them. Let me read here. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in, life in you. Now, the Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorian traditions interpret this in a literal sense in that Jesus means you have to literally physically ingest, ingest him in the sacrament of the Eucharist. In the sacrament of the Eucharist. Now follow with me. They take this passage as confirming that when the priest prays over the elements, the bread and the wine, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the bread and the wine. Now see again. I'm not too educated on the Orthodox understanding because I've heard Orthodox Christians tell me they hold to the similar view of the Roman Catholic Church, transubstantiation. But then I've been told they hold to consubstantiation. And when it comes to the Nestorian Church, the church of my ancestors, the Assyrians, I've been told they believe in consubstantiation. So I don't know. I'm an ignoramus. I do know that in the Roman Catholic tradition, when the priest prays, the bread and the wine transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to become the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the appearance looks like bread and wine, but the substance is no longer bread. The substance is no longer wine. It appears as bread and wine, what they call the accidents. But the substance of the bread now becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the wine becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So it's transformed. That's why it's called transubstantiation. Trans, the substance is transformed. So it's no longer the substance of bread, the substance of wine. It's now the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Now in the Roman Catholic tradition, the wine becomes the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. And the bread becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Now my question is for the Orthodox here. I don't want to misrepresent your view. Do you believe in transubstantiation? First, I just want to know. Look at this guy, transgender. What do you mean transgender love life? I thought you're a brother in Christ. Why would you mock something so sacred? I don't get it. As long as it's not transgender. Come on, love life. I know you're a brother in Christ. Let's not joke when it comes to something so sacred and holy. Yeah, but not when it comes to something so sacred. When it comes to the things of God, let's have some reverence and fear for our God. Right? Okay. So an Orthodox says you don't believe in transubstantiation. So you believe what I would term consubstantiation, right? So now you have an Ethiopian Orthodox who says he does believe in transubstantiation. So I'm very confused. Okay, forgive me. I'm confused. Okay, so the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they believe in transubstantiation. What about the Greek Orthodox or the Russian Orthodox? And I'm not confused because I'm mocking them because there are different branches of Orthodox. Okay, so Michelle, are you Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox? Okay, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, you don't define it, or would you say, not, let me explain what consubstantiation is, and I've been told that's what Martin Luther believed. Again, I'm no scholar, I'm dependent on, on what scholars teach, and this hasn't been an issue of debate in which I've had to go in depth on this, but I've been told that Martin Luther held to consubstantiation. Now, what is the difference? Consubstantiation says, that the substance of bread and the substance of wine still remain bread and wine, but it's now joined to, the substance of bread is joined to the physical body of Christ. The substance of wine is joined to the blood of Christ. So now there are two substances conjoined, con, together. So you have bread, wine, joined to the body and blood of Jesus. So consubstantiation teaches they're basically... Two substances, but it's actually three because the substance of wine and bread, that would be two with the body and blood of Christ, right? So that's consubstantiation. Now, for the rest of you, do you understand the difference between transubstantiation? Transubstantiation means the bread and wine. The substance of bread is changed. It's no longer bread. It appears as bread, but it's no longer bread. It becomes the body, blood 
of our Lord Jesus. The wine appears as wine, but it's changed into the blood of Christ. So it's no longer wine in substance. That's transubstantiation. Consubstantiation teaches wine still remains wine in substance, but it's now joined to the blood of Christ. The bread still remains bread in substance. It's essence still bread, but it's joined to the body of Christ. That's the difference between the two positions. Well, I just began, not, so you haven't missed much. So the Eastern Oriental Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, do you hold to consubstantiation or transubstantiation? We'll make it quick, and then I'm going to get into my explanation of John 6. I'm not saying accept it, how I see it. Okay. So when you say similar, is it consubstantiation or transubstantiation? Help me out, Orthodox. Either way, as you guys des describe, okay, well, friend, we even use the real presence differently than you do. All the stars are dead. We use real presence differently the way you do. See, I believe Jesus is truly present. He's present in a real sense in communion, but he's not present physically in that the bread and wine are not his physical body and blood. I know you think I'm wrong. So even the term real presence doesn't communicate much to me, but let's put that aside. Let's, let's work with transubstantiation. Does John 6, 53 teach that that's what goes on in the Eucharist, what they call the mass or the Lord's supper? Is Jesus saying that you have to physically, physically ingest him? eat him and drink him physically to have life. Is that what John 6.53 is talking about? In my view, no, right? In my view, no. Contextually, that's not Jesus' point. Now, understand what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that your belief in transubstantiation, consubstantiation is wrong necessarily. What I'm saying is that this passage doesn't support it. That's my view, and I'm going to explain my view if you're ready. But I want to ask another question of the Orthodox before we go into the passage. Am I boring you guys with this, by the way? Am I boring you with this stuff? Okay, I just don't want to be boring. I want to hear to serve you for the sake of the Lord. Okay, now, and as you notice, I like to focus more on the doctrines of the Christian faith than Islam. Okay, now coming back to the issue. For the Orthodox here, do you believe the wine not only is the blood of Christ, but also the body of Christ? So the wine... Is the body and blood of Christ? Do you guys believe that? The wine is the body and blood of Christ? So you want to make sure what the Orthodox believe. I don't know. I really don't know. And I'm not going to talk about a tradition. I'm ignorant. Okay, so Michelle, I'll save. You believe that the wine just becomes the blood, right? Or is the blood? Okay. And the bread is the body or becomes the body, right? Now, the that reason why I say that is because in the Roman Catholic tradition, the bread is not just the body, it's the body and, and blood. The wine is not just the blood, it's the blood and body. So you see the difference there? In the Roman Catholic view, the bread becomes the body and blood, and the wine becomes the body and blood. But as you see, the Orthodox believe, no, the wine is the blood, and the bread is the body, which is actually closer to what the Bible teaches. Right? That's actually closer to what the Bible teaches. So again, differences here. Now, I want you to highlight the difference. The Orthodox Church is also an apostolic church. They are apostolic churches. You can't deny that. Historically, they can trace themselves to the time of the apostles, right? <clears throat> Coptic Church claims the same. So does the Nestorian Church. But do you understand Orthodox and Roman Catholic and Coptics? All of you <clears throat> claim apostolic succession. And historically, we know that these traditions can trace themselves to the apostles. But you realize that just because you're apostolic, a church that comes from the apostles, doesn't mean that you've necessarily maintained doctrinal purity, right? Because all of you would agree that the other apostolic church lost its way in some sense, right? So you agree that just because a church was started by an apostle, that doesn't guarantee that church will maintain absolute doctrinal purity, right? And be correct, correct? You agree, right? Now, what's interesting about that is that was the case in the time of the apostles. Let me guys teach you something. No, I believe that all the stars are needed. So don't take this as an attack on any tradition. I'm just highlighting the fact that any tradition can claim to come from the apostles and appeal to the fathers. And still, that doesn't mean they're right. 
because you acknowledge that about the other apostolic churches. Okay, we also claim apostolic succession. So I want everyone else to see that and learn. You guys are learning? There are many traditions that claim apostolic succession, that they come from the apostles, but are you guys seeing that they don't all agree, and then one tradition will accuse the other tradition of falling away in some sense? That's all I'm trying to highlight. Now, coming back, that shouldn't surprise you because this was taking place in the time of the apostles. Even the presence of the apostles did not guarantee perfect unity in matters of faith and morals among Christians. Did you guys know that? Thank you, Bill Thompson. He, he actually sees that, right? Even in the time of the apostles, the apostles, their presence did not guarantee that the Christians would be perfectly united in faith and morals. Proof of it is, Bill mentioned, the fact that Paul has to rebuke the Galatians for being easily swayed by false Christians, false apostles, to follow a false gospel. But they had the benefit of the apostle Paul being there to correct it. But let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation, seven churches in Asia, seven churches started by the apostles, one of whom is the church at Ephesus. If you go to Revelations 2 and 3, one of whom is the church of Ephesus, a church that Paul sent an inspired letter to. Five of them are so corrupt and fallen, fallen away that Jesus threatens to remove them from his presence if they don't repent. And this is in the lifetime of the apostle John. Isn't that amazing? In the lifetime of the apostle John, five of the seven apostolic churches have corrupted themselves to the extent that the Lord Jesus now warns them from heaven, get things in order, I'm going to remove you. Only two remain sound, the church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2 and 3. What's the point, folks? Even the presence of the apostles could not guarantee absolute perfect unity in regards to faith and morals. So don't be surprised you're going to have divisions today. Now, that's not an argument against the apostles any more than you have so many Protestant denominations being a legitimate argument against those who believe in the absolute authority of the Bible. See where I'm going with this? Because that's one of the objections against Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is a blueprint for anarchy. So many denominations. But hold on. Even the apostles could not guarantee perfect unity among Christians. Does that mean the apostles were defective? Or that just tells you that human beings are so corrupt by their nature and that you have Satan working overtime to stop perfect unity from existing. Right? Everyone get with me so far, right? Let's go to back go to John 6:53. Let's look at it and see what my interpretation is. I know the Orthodox, the cop, they're not gonna accept it. You know, that's fine. Don't accept it. I'm just gonna tell you, hear me out. Okay, let's go to back go back to John 6:53. John 6:53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send to you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So this is used to proof. So you got to eat Jesus' flesh physically and drink his blood physically, right? So, yeah, I'm drinking coffee. How do you eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ? The answer is through the sacrament of the Eucharist. So this is used to prove you must eat Jesus physically and drink his blood physically. And you do so in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the Mass. Now... Someone asked me, do I take that position? Is that what John 6 is teaching? Well, number one, in the immediate context. Are you guys ready to learn how to exegete, how to interpret scripture? Are you ready now? Number one, when you want to understand a passage, it is vitally important that you understand a passage in its immediate context. The immediate context means the chapter itself or its historical setting. Historical setting. In that immediate context, in its historical setting, Jesus hadn't mentioned the Eucharist. That was still in the future. So now, if we were to take these words literally in their immediate context, then that means the people would have understood that they would have to gnaw on Jesus' body that was standing there, which would be offensive to them, right? So if I take it in its historical context, this passage in its historical context says nothing about 
eating Jesus physically and drinking his blood physically in the Eucharist because he hasn't even brought up the Eucharist because that took place on Passover in the future. So on a literal reading of this passage, literally Jesus saying, here, not my flesh and try to suck the blood out of my body. If we take it literally, right? If you Are you with me there? You want me there before I move on to the next point? So in its immediate historical context, does it have anything to do with the Passover where the Lord changed the meaning of the Passover into a remembrance of his sacrifice where he took the element and says, this is my body and blood in its context? No, because that's still future. But someone will say, oh, but yes, it is future. And though historically in that context, the people hearing him would have no idea that he's referring to the Eucharist. Still later on, he clarifies it to his apostles. And there is where we find the connection with John 6. It's later we find the connection with John 6, where he then takes the bread and wine, says, this is my body, this is my blood, take it, and that's how you eat my flesh and drink my blood. But then that leads me to my second point. My second point is that Jesus goes on to explain things that he says to the crowds, right? that he doesn't clarify to the crowds, but he explains to the apostles. Let me repeat it again. The literal meaning of his words to the crowds is that you're going to have to now in my body, this body, start eating it and try sucking the blood out of me, which is why they're offended. What? But some will say, yeah, he didn't explain it to the crowds because he would leave the explanation of his words to his inner circle, the apostles. But then that confirms my point. Because if we then see how Jesus goes on to explain those words, we see that Jesus didn't mean it physically, but spiritually. We are to spiritually ingest, spiritually gnaw, spiritually eat, and spiritually drink Jesus' flesh and blood. You see where I'm going with this? You see what I'm doing here? So if you're saying to me, yeah, in its historical context, the outsiders would have misunderstood that he's saying, not at this body that's standing before you and suck the blood out of me. And they clearly misunderstood because Jesus went on to explain, no, you don't eat this flesh and drink the blood that's in my veins now. You do so sacramentally. Then you're confirming my point. The literal interpretation in that context is wrong. They misunderstood him. You want me there? The literal meaning of his words in that context was wrong because he didn't literally mean come and gnaw at this body that's standing before you and suck the blood out of my veins. So you're agreeing with me. The literal interpretation will not make sense in that context because even those of you who believe that you have to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ believe that you do so sacramentally through the elements of the bread and the wine. But that was not stated there to the crowds. Am I making sense or am I going too fast and confusing you before I move on? And that Jesus often doesn't explain the import of his words to outsiders who proven themselves unworthy, unworthy of the kingdom. Let's go to Mark 4, 10 to 12. Mark 4, 10 to 12. So I'm going to give you my understanding of the passage. Take it, leave it, but don't stone me. And then we'll talk about communion saints if you're interested. Mark 4, 10 to 12. Danny Zella, you only know that because of the later account. We're talking about what those words meant to his audience at that moment who did not have the benefit of being there at the Passover to hear Jesus take the bread and the wine and say, this is my body, this is my blood. Mark 4, 10 to 12. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked him the parable. Now watch what our Lord says, how he speaks to outsiders who've shown themselves unworthy of the mysteries of the kingdom. Pay attention. And he said unto them, unto you, you inner circle, you who follow me, it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without the outside, all these things are done in parables that seeing they may see and not perceive. And hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. See what our Lord said? I will now speak in parables to these outsiders because they've shown themselves so wicked and evil and stiff-necked stiff 
They're unworthy of the knowledge of the mysteries. I will explain it to you. So right there that tells you that when Jesus is talking to outsiders, you have to be cautious and see, is he speaking parabolically, figuratively? And then we'll explain the true meaning of his words later on, or is he speaking at face value, literally? So I'm going to ask everyone the question. The literal meaning of his words in that context in John 6, the literal meaning of his words in that context in John 6, to the outsiders that he didn't explain, would lead them to assume that he's saying, okay, his flesh is there, his blood is there. He wants us now to start biting his flesh, gnawing on it, and sucking the blood out of his veins. Is he nuts? See, that's how they would have taken it literally. Which of you ag agree that's what Jesus meant? Does anyone agree that's what Jesus meant? Anyone? Nobody, right? So therefore, you're agreeing with me, it can't be literal. You agree with me, it can't be literal. So thank you. See, this is, the, this is where I'm trying to lead you. So then does he explain the actual meaning of his words? And does he do it in that chapter? Does he explain the meaning of his words? And does he do it in that chapter? Absolutely. Let's go to John 6 and let's pick it up. <clears throat> let's read. Yeah, well, let's break it down. Let's go to 53. All the way to 59. John 6, 53 to 59. John 6, 53 to 59. It can be, Mikey, if he goes on to explain it. That's what I'm getting at, Mikey. I'm going to see if it's still literal, and then he shows how you are to literally eat him, or is it spiritual? Let's read. Guys, read with me. Let's see. It can be, but let's see. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I said unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Pay attention. Hath eternal life, I will raise him up at the last day. Pay attention to 54. We're going to revisit in a minute. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now 57. And the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna <clears throat> and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So notice, he now calls his flesh and blood bread. Here's where... Oftentimes, the Roman Catholic apologists will, will cite to show you, see, he never explained it figuratively. He meant it literally because when his disciples were offended and walked away, he never corrected their misunderstanding of his words if they weren't literal. Because then they quote to you John 6, 60. Let's read John 6, 60 to 62. Let's break it down. John 6, 60 to 62. So uh, let's see. Did he explain it to them or not? John 6, 60 to 62. Okay, then many thereof, therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? See, the disciples, man, this is hard. He actually wants us to gnaw on his flesh and suck the blood out of his veins. What? Does this offend you? Are you astonished at this? Is this blowing your mind away? When Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Now watch here, 62. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now notice what he's saying. This shocks you? Then imagine when you see me physically return to heaven, how much more shocked will you be then? So, so far it seems, so far it seems that Jesus meant it literally because that's how even his disciples understood Oh, contraire. Now let's read John 6, 63 to 66. He then explains it to them. John 6, 63 to 66. Watch here. Watch here. Watch here, guys. Here, now he explains it to those who are his disciples. 
John 6, 63 to 66. It is the spirit that quickeneth give life. The flesh profiteth nothing. Bam, right there. Flesh is, means nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. He just went and explained what he meant. Don't get fixated on the flesh. It's Flesh does nothing. The way you eat me and drink me is by taking my words and acting upon them. Those are the words that give you life. He does explain it to them. And he explains it to them in such a way to show it's not literal. It's right there. Catholics, Orthodox, you got to deal with it. For the insiders, he told them, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh means nothing. Why is he now saying the flesh means nothing after just going out of his way to saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood? Because he's explaining to them, you don't eat my flesh physically, drink my blood physically. You do so spiritually by ingesting my words. Now let's read 65 and 66. 65 and 66. Or let's read 64 to 66. I'm sorry. That was 63. Who said his crucifixion is meaningless? Some guy. Why would you attack straw man and bring out a red herring? His crucifixion is the basis upon which you can be forgiven and receive eternal life when you turn to Jesus. Okay? 664 to 66. I'm a biblicist. When Protestantism is right, I accept. When Catholics are right, I accept. Okay. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, hold on, please, one second. Okay. For, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, notice why they walked away. Here's where, I'm sorry to say this, but Catholic apologists misrepresent the text. They say they walked away because Jesus meant it literally. That's not why they walked away, folks. They walked away when he exposed their hearts that they weren't all true believers because they were not drawn by the Father. They got offended and left him. It doesn't say they left him because of eating the flesh and drinking the blood because he explained it to them. So when did they leave? When he said, well, not all of you are true believers because you cannot come to me unless you're drawn by the Father. So accusing them of being false believers. And they got offended at that and walked away. Right there. The scripture just said it what we read, Jacob. If you came late and you haven't been followed, don't disturb me then. Because I've been unpacking this for the past 20 minutes. So number one, they did not walk away because he meant it literally. He didn't. He explained it to them in John 6, 63. So why did they walk away? Because he said, not all of you are true believers. That's why I said no one can come to me except the Father draws him. In other words, I know who you are and I know some of you are fake. And they walked away at that. They didn't walk away because of the words. They were offended at first, but he explained it. So did Jesus go on and explain what he meant? Yes, John 6, 63. Now, earlier in the chapter, does he give any indication that eating his flesh, drinking his blood is not to be done physically but spiritually by coming to him in faith and trusting him? Yes. John 6, 53 is in the middle of the chapter. John 6, 53 is in the middle of the chapter. Tiger Mask, what did I say earlier? Don't debate me. I could care less if you're not convinced. Not being convinced and refuting me is not the same. Please don't egg me on and debate me. Keep your opinion to yourself. I know you're getting animated because I'm addressing the contextual meaning that doesn't agree with your assumption. Keep it to yourself. Don't egg me on. By, I'm not convinced. And Muslims are not convinced that Jesus is God. So Tiger Mask, let's become Muslim. Muslims are not convinced the Bible is the word of God. Don't say something that is emotive and silly. Come on, man. Let's come back here. Does he say anything earlier in the chapter to indicate eating him and drinking him is to be done spiritually by coming to him in faith? Yes. Let's go to John 6, 27 to 33. John 6, 27 to 33. Let me prove it to you. John 6, 27 to 33. That's what I even said in the beginning. Don't get emotional. Don't get angry. Don't debate me. Hear me out and reject it if you want. But don't tell me I'm not convinced. Oh, that really, really impresses me. Muslims tell me they're not convinced all day, all night. That means I should give up on Christianity. Come on, man. You're a Christian. You need to argue better than this. John 6, 27, 29. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat. Read with me. 
which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now they asked him, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What work must we do to get this meat? Notice 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. So you want this meat? You want this bread that results in eternal life? Believe in me, the one he sent. Now 30. They said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? What proof do you give that we need to believe in you and trust in you for this meat that doesn't perish? Good question. Okay, let's read. Our fathers did eat the man in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now watch what our Lord says, 633. For, for the bread of God is he, We skips, you skips 32, brother. You went from 31 to 33. So you got to post 32 and 33. You skip 30. You skip 32. I don't see it, brother. Where? I see 31. No, 32. It's 31 to 33. Oh, you went backwards. So you put 32 before 31, you sinner. Okay, let's try it again. Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And then 33. Notice what he says. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now notice Jesus says he's bread. Now no one takes that literally. They take it spiritually, metaphorically, symbolically. I am the bread that comes down that gives life to the world. I am the bread that gives life. So you got to eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now physically, here's how you do it. Here's the answer. John 6, 34 to 40. John 6, 34 to 40. Here it goes. John 6, 34 to 40. Does he explain what it means to eat him and drink him? Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, here you go, folks. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. There you go. Jesus, how do I eat your flesh and drink your blood? Come to me, believe in me. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. Believe in me, trust in me, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. He explained it before and after what he meant, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. 38 to 40. 38 to 40. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Now notice 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, you look to the Son, behold the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Wow. So looking to the Son, coming to the Son, believing in the Son, Gives you everlasting life. Now let's contrast that in John 6.53 again. John 6.53 one more time. Let's see. Remember, look to the sun, coming to the sun, believing in the sun. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. You'll be giving everlasting life. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I said to you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So you got to eat his flesh and drink his blood to have life in you. Okay, 650, 51. John 6, 50 to 51. And we're going to look at 54. John 6, 50 to 51. Watch here now. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and die and not die. He will not die. And then 51. I know, man. Allergies. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat up this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I, we're missing a part, will give for the life of the world. So I give my flesh for the salvation of the world. Whoever comes and eats my flesh will have life in himself, never die. 654. 654. 654. So we can wrap it up. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
You eat my flesh, drink my blood. You have eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. Now let's look at John 6, 39 to 40. John 6, 39 to 40. Now let's see if you can make the connection with 654. John 6, 39 to 40. Make the connection. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, believeth on him, hath everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Identical to 54. But notice the difference. In verse 40, it's looking to him and believing in him that results in having everlasting life and Jesus raising you up. But in 54, it's eating his flesh and drinking his blood that results in having everlasting life and Christ raising you up. Do you see what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood? To eat his flesh and drink his blood is to come to him, to behold him, to believe in him, and then I'll have everlasting life and I'll be raised up. So if I'm honest to the context, if I let the context explain 653 and not my tradition, then contextually there is no way of getting around the plain meaning of Jesus' words that the way I eat his flesh and drink his blood is not sacramentally. It's by coming to him in faith, looking to him in faith, and that's how I gnaw at him, feast at him, feast on him, and drink his blood spiritually by coming to him and having fellowship with him. So both before and after, Jesus already explained what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood. He tells you, John 6, 35, let's look at it. John 6, 35. Yep, well, obviously, to follow him is to carry your cross. And Jesus said unto him, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Come to me, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So did you see, if I read 653 in the verses before and after, if I just read that in the context, the last thing I will conclude is that Jesus is telling me to physically eat his flesh and physically drink his blood because he explained, I'm speaking spiritually. The flesh means nothing. John 6, 63. Zella, you're getting too animated. I don't want to block you. Calm down. Okay. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Can you explain to me why would Jesus say here, the flesh means nothing? Now, I want you to save this brother's comments, Alpha Omega. Thank you, brother, for being sincere and respecting me enough to, even though you disagree, notice his comments. Though I'm orthodox, I'm here to learn. Your point is honestly sound. I will try to study more about this topic. God bless you. That's all I'm asking. Hear me out. Don't believe me, but hear me out. So again, in John 6, 63, why would Jesus say the flesh means nothing when he just said the flesh means everything? Eat my flesh. Because he's trying to communicate to us who are the insiders, the disciples to whom the mysteries of the kingdom are given. Don't get hung up on eating my flesh physically or drinking my blood physically. That's not what I meant. I didn't explain it to them. I'm explaining it to you. The way you eat me, the way you drink me is come to me by faith, behold me, right? Feast on me spiritually, and you will have everlasting life, and I'll raise you up at the last. And by the way, interestingly, the great Augustine, who's not so great to the Orthodox, that's how he interpreted John 6. Even Augustine interpreted John 6 spiritually, not physically, not sacramentally. With me there? How can it be the first Christian's tradition when I just read you the words of the first Christian, John? You don't get any earlier than John. And I explained what John meant in the context in John's writing. He is the first Christian. So what are you talking about, Zella? Not my tradition, the first Christian tradition. That is the Christian tradition. John, the apostle, is giving me this tradition and explaining it. No, he's not the father of Catholics. Is that clear? That's my take on John 6.53. Now, I don't, I don't want you to accept what I say. Take what I had to say in context, right?
Okay, Edmund, you know I'm going to have to send you on your merry way, right? Here, just to show you that you're not listening because you don't want to learn. Guys, did I connect vague passages or I connected the passages found in the very chapter? Okay, see, Edmund, Michael D., great exegesis. Did I connect vague passages or did I simply read John 6.53 in the chapter itself? What was vague about the chapter? Edmund, you accuse me of that again. You're going to have to leave my page. And look, I'm not here for a popularity contest, and I'm not here to be unnecessarily offensive. However, if you're coming here because you want to debate, leave. This is not a channel for you. There are YouTube channels where you can debate. This is not it. I'm here to teach seriously for those who want to hear. Okay? So don't ever accuse me of connecting vague passages when it's the very chapter where we find those words. What's vague about it? John 6, 53. So let's forget verses 27 to 40. Let's forget that. and Let's for forget verse 63 and focus on 53. Anyway, that's my take on John 6. Are we ready for the communion of saints? Now the Protestants are going to get offended. Okay, give me one minute. I got to get the air conditioning because I'm getting heated here. Now, Protestants, are you ready to get offended? And then I'm done and I got to go work out. Hold on. I'll be right back. Hold on, guys. One second. Okay. Okay, Protestants, you ready to get offended? Well, you can't be ex born again. If you're born again, there's no ex about it. <laughs> you can't be unborn. Andrew, that doesn't make sense. You can't be unborn. So you were never born again. It's like saying, yeah, I, you know, I was born physically. Now I'm not physically. I, un I have undone my physical birth. Good one. Uh, uh, good one. Asher, this guy, if there was 20 points of Calvinism, he'd invent it. Anyway. Did you guys hear my exegesis of John 6, 53, why I don't take it as literally the physical body and blood of Christ? Was that clear? Ash, did you hear that or you just came at the end of this? Idiotai apologetics. What did you think of the exegesis thus far? Just before I move on. Yep, exactly, I'm Warren. Because they'll tell you that the Greek word means to chew or gnaw at. Yeah, you do chew and gnaw on Jesus spiritually, right? Because that's another argument. Well, the word is trego, and that means to physically gnaw at something. Well, that's its meaning in classical Greek. But you can even take the physical gnawing spiritually because I gnaw on Jesus' flesh and his blood by meditating on his words and having fellowship with him. It doesn't have to be a physical gnawing, gnawing, G-N-A-W-I-N-G. No, well, right now you're going to condemn me as apostate. Now, be careful. Asher gets a little wild, riled up. Now, for those who were not Protestant, you got offended at my exegesis. Now, Protestants, you're going to get offended on my teaching on the communion of saints. And I got some people that are so Protestant, they're going to start condemning me, think I'm becoming Roman Catholic. In fact, James White said that on a show one time. Sam Shimon looks like he's going to become Roman Catholic. Again, let me, let me just repeat myself for the record. I want to be as biblical as possible. So if there's something in the Catholic tradition that's biblical, I'll accept. Other things that are not, I reject. Same with Orthodox. Same with the Coptics. Same with Protestantism. I want to call myself a biblicist. I know that's easy because everyone thinks they're being biblical, but that really, I want to be a biblicist. So you're going to hear me th say things that sound more like Catholicism, but I'm not Roman Catholic. And for the record, there are a lot of things in Roman Catholicism I cannot accept with a clear conscience. And I'm not offending Roman Catholics. I can't accept papal infallibility or that the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth. I just don't see it scripturally or historically. I can't accept purgatory. That's just me. I know you guys believe these things are true and I'm wrong. All right, well, I don't see it, and I can't make you see something. You can't make me see something. Thus far, I've heard the best arguments from the Catholic position for purgatory, papal infallibility, 
the primacy of the Pope? I'm not convinced. So don't stone me, right? I'm not convinced. Are you with me there? Says, okay, I'm, I'm not convinced. But now for the Protestants, I'm going to share with you 20 years of studying this issue and the conclusion I've arrived at, but I don't want you to stone me. I don't want you to stone me because to believe this doesn't make you a Roman Catholic any more than it makes you an Orthodox, any more than it makes you a Coptic, because the communion of saints is not unique to Catholicism. The belief in the communion of saints is something held, upon, held by the various traditions even before they split, right? The doctrine of the communion of saints was something believed by the churches before they split, before the Assyrian church, called the Assyrian church, was cut off from the church at large, before the Coptics were cut off because of their miaphysitism, and before the Orthodox and the Catholic cut off, you find this belief in the communion of saints that predate the divisions of the 5th century. You know what that means, right? No, Zell, I'm not interested in hearing you pontificate and attack me and accuse me of, of perverting church history. You know what that means, right? The belief of the communion of saints is something that predates the 5th century. It's quite early. Now, for some people, it's not early enough. That's okay. I'm going to go into the biblical basis for my belief that you have people who are alive in heaven, glorified, perfected, whom God does allow to be aware of things on earth. Are you ready now? Let me repeat it again. Okay, sorry. Pray for my internet connectivity. It's low. Let me repeat it again. I'm now going to make a biblical case for the position that glorified believers in heaven are perfected and more alive than us on earth who struggle with sin and that God can make things known to them that take place on earth. Make them aware of things on earth. Are you guys ready for the evidence? Don't make up your mind before you hear the case, and if you still reject it, that's fine. Are you ready for this? Can we go into that? Okay. Let me repeat what I'm going to demonstrate. The Bible is clear. Glorified believers and angels in heaven, because heaven is not part of the physical universe. It's another dimension, and there's a veil between heaven and earth that God can remove the veil so we can see heaven and heaven can see, see us. I'll prove to you that heaven is another dimension, not part of the physical universe, and there's a veil. In other words, you can be in your room and the door to heaven open up right there before your ceiling. So someone looks at the ceiling, but you see the veil of heaven removed and you're seeing heaven and I'm seeing a ceiling, right? And you find this often at the deathbed of people. People are about to die. This is true. This is documented. It's not just anecdotal. It's documented even by those in the medical field. Those who are dying will often see the other side, whereas the person next to him, all he sees is the ceiling or the door. But the person's looking at the ceiling door as if he's seeing people. He says, oh, look, they're angels. Oh, look, there's Jesus. Oh, Because the veil is being removed. So heaven is not part of the physical universe. It is another dimension. And there's a veil between heaven and this dimension. And when the veil is removed, heaven is right there. It's right next to you. Can I prove that to you from Scripture, that it's a dimension in which there's a door or a veil that is removed or a door that opened, then you can see it. Can I prove that to you? Thank God this is hell. What? Okay, let's go to Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. Andrew Martin, NDEs are not delusions. In the sense that, yes, people are experiencing conscious activity apart from brain activity. But what they're seeing is not necessarily from God. It can be a demonic deception. So in that sense, it can be a demonic delusion. But that these people who were clinically dead are still consciously alive apart from brain activity. That's a fact documented and proven by the medical field who are not necessarily Christian. And I don't base my belief on NDEs. I believe based it on the Bible. So that when an NDE occurs, I'm not surprised because the Bible teaches me to accept that, to expect that phenomenon. Anyway, Mark 1.10. One more. One more time. Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. Yes, exactly, Bill Thompson. It's not a geog geog geographical place in the physical universe. It is a spiritual universe. Spiritual geography. Mark 110, read with me, guys. Focus. 
And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened. There you go. And the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Did you catch it? Heaven opened. The dimension we call heaven where God dwells with angels open and the spirit came down in the shape of a dove. You guys see it? Heavens were rent open. Do you see that or no? Before we move on, postmark 110 one more time. I just want to make sure you catch it because I'm going to give you several. You see, heavens open, the spirit came down like a dove. Acts 7, 56. Well, we're going to read Acts 7, 55 to 56. This Bible is beautiful. It's majestic. It's supernatural. It's deep because it's the word of the true God. The more you plunge it, the more you stand in awe of its author. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Pay attention to 56. Walter, I hope you're not one of those guys who are mocking the faith because, you know, I'll ban you, right? I'll block you. Acts 7, 55 to 56. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now notice 56. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened. There you go. It opened. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, the people standing there, when they looked to heaven, they saw the sky, if not the stars. I actually like Andrew Martin. Though he's an atheist, he's still an open-minded atheist. Pray that he comes to worship Jesus. Good man. I don't care what they say about you, Andrew. You're a good man. But did you notice? Stephen, being filled with the Holy Spirit, didn't see the sky. He saw heaven where Jesus dwells standing. Acts 7, 56. One more time. That was Acts 7, 55, 56. But we're going to look at 56, Christian princes. Read. Acts 7, 56. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Wow. Yes, Gerald Perry. Up until the time of Christ, they went to what we call Hades. But I don't want to talk about that right now. But you're right. Did you see it? So when heavens opened, he saw Jesus. But the people next to him didn't see Jesus. They saw the sky and thought he's nuts. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Man, this guy's nuts. Side note. The Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Here he's standing. Do you know why? Here, again, it will move you in the spirit. Jesus, our Lord, in his humbleness, stands up to greet his martyr and welcome him into his loving arms. The king stands up from the throne and says to Stephen, son, welcome, time to come home. You see how amazing Jesus is? I saw the Son of Man standing. So he's not sitting. The Lord in honor of the first martyr, because he was about to be killed, stood up in honor of his martyr, stands up and says to Stephen, Son, welcome home. Time to enter your rest. See? Jesus is the one we want to welcome us, don't we? <clears throat> it moves me in the spirit. May the Lord Jesus forgive me because I fail him. Please, Lord, we love you. Lord Jesus, please help me crucify my flesh. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing, the love of the Lord? I mean, think about it. The king of glory, the creator of heaven and earth, would stand in honor of maggots like us. So Stephen looks up. <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the most important being in all existence. I didn't say creation. The most important being in all existence, God Almighty, stands up in honor of his servant. Stephen, come home, son. Time to rest. <clears throat> sorry, guys. It just moves me. Just pray for me, right? That Jesus will have mercy on me, be patient with me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Tiny napkins that I have. The Lord is good. I fail him all the time, but I beg the Lord to have mercy on me, Lord. <clears throat> have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. <clears throat> Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. I fail you, Lord. All right. Uh, okay, so the point was Acts 7.56, right? Acts 7.56. The heavens opened. Heavens opened. So heaven is another dimension. Let me give you another passage. Relation chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Yes, please pray for me to never shame Jesus, but to die for the Lord. Good to see you, warrior woman. God bless you, sister. <clears throat> another passage where it says heaven, heaven's opened up. It's another dimension. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 3. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Did you catch it? A door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither, and I will show you the, the, the things which must here, be hereafter. Loosen my tongue, Lord. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he sat, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Did you catch it? John sees the door to this dimension we call heaven open. And notice how he got there. The Holy Spirit transported him there. Immediately in the Spirit, he entered. Notice the connection with the Spirit. It's the Spirit that transports you to heaven and allows you to see the other side. Did you see it? Did you guys see that in Revelation 4.2? 4, 2? Immediately I was in the Spirit. And that's what happened with Stephen. I don't know if you remember Stephen. Let's go to Acts 7, 55 to 56. How did Stephen see the other side? When heaven opened, you know why? Because the Holy Spirit allowed him to see. Because let's look at Acts 7, 55 to 56. Okay. We love you, Jesus. Have mercy on us and purify our motives, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Acts 7, 55, 56. But he being full of the Holy Ghost. Did you catch it? Full of the Holy Spirit, he saw heavens open. You see, you cannot live the Christian life, you cannot love Jesus, and you cannot enter his presence apart from the beautiful Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need him desperately. You caught it? See the Trinity again? The Spirit fills Stephen, removes the veil so Stephen can see Jesus, John, in the Spirit, is transported into that open door. So the Spirit brings us to Jesus who brings us to God. You better believe it. And as a side note, as we're talking about Stephen, you want to see the mercy of the Lord? Did you know Jesus appeared to him before he got stoned? Because Jesus knew Stephen was about to be killed. But to make it easy for his martyr to die, he appeared to him in glory so that when the stones hit his body, Stephen could care less about the pain because with each stone, he realized, I'm about to enter the presence of my Lord. Do you know that? That's why Jesus stands up, says, son, you're about to come home. Don't be afraid of what they're going to do to you because what they are going to do to you is nothing in comparison to the infinite love and joy you're about to experience in a second as you enter my presence. You know that, right? And if you don't believe me, let's read Acts 7, 56 to 60. Acts 7, 56 to 60. Just to, Acts 7, 56 to 60. Read with me. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, right? And cast them out of the city and stoned them. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Notice Saul was there. Saul was there. And they stoned Stephen. Calling upon God. Now notice Stephen calls upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Did you see it? 
The God he calls upon to receive his life at the point of death is Jesus. Called upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. See, that's the beauty. Once you see Jesus, you won't hate your detractors. You'll have mercy and pity for them because they do not know who they're going to face in judgment if they don't repent. So Jesus shows up before Stephen is killed. And as Stephen is being stoned, he's about to die. He looks to Jesus, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Lord, do not hold this sin against them. If they can only see what I see, if they can only behold how beautiful you are, they too would be falling in love with you. What's the point? If you're truly a believer and you love the Lord, this will happen to you when you're about to die. When you're about to die, you too will see the other side. The veil will be removed and you'll enter the presence of Christ. I guarantee you that's going to happen because the Bible says so and the Bible does not lie. So be encouraged, right? Okay, isn't that beautiful? Ali Khadr, read this passage and don't be afraid. And by the way, another point. I may have to do a part two. Another point related to this text. Another point. <clears throat> Saul was there giving approval, right? Saul was there giving approval. Now, what I want you to do is read Acts 7, 60 and chapter 8, verse 1, because I want to show you how Jesus honors Stephen. If you read the entire chapter, Acts 7, it says, Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, mighty in the Scriptures, and Acts 6 tells us that he had the countenance of an angel, that when he looked at him, he looked like an angel, right? Now, watch what happens here. Acts 7, 60 and chapter 8, verse 1. Watch here. I may have to do a part two, yeah. I'm probably going to have to do part two tomorrow. Acts 7, 60 and chapter 8, verse 1. Everybody here? What happened? The king of kings stands for maggots like us. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now notice 8, 1, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they're all scattered abroad. Did you catch it? Do you think it's a coincidence that Luke is mentioning Saul approving of Stephen's death? You know what he's trying to show you? When Jesus said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. <clears throat> Jesus honored his prayer because he then goes about converting Saul to replace him. In other words, Stephen's intercession was used by the Lord Jesus to bring about the salvation of Saul. Yes, my glorious martyr, my love for you, I will honor your request. That man is going to be just as mighty as you in Scripture, filled with the Spirit like you, eloquent in Scripture, and be my witness in honor of your prayer. Did you see that? So that tells you Jesus takes your prayers and intercession into account in bringing about the salvation of believers. Let me repeat. That shows you Jesus our Lord will honor the prayers of the righteous, those covered by his blood who walk in union with him, the blood of the martyrs, and bringing about the salvation of believers. So your prayers are not in vain. So going back to the point, does the Bible teach that this spiritual dimension called heaven is not part of the physical universe, but it's another dimension, and there's a veil, a door that can open up, and you see it right in front of you. In other words, I can be in my home, and I can see the door open, and there's heaven right there in my ceiling, or there's heaven right in front of me. Did you see it? Mark 1.10. Acts 7, 56, Revelation 4, 1. Right? Let me give you another one. Acts, Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack 1 Timothy chapter 2, and Lord willing, we'll do part 2 tomorrow. I'll do part 2 on the communion saints tomorrow. 
because it's already been over an hour. So tomorrow, God willing, same time, okay? Let's go again, Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 2. But I'm going to deal with 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5. Uh, yeah, we'll do with verse 5. Because that's a passage often used, and I used to use it. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. Do you catch it, what he's saying here? Oh, God, that you would tear the heavens open and would come down. You see what he's asking? Remove the veil that separates heaven from us and come down, O oh God. One more time. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Did you catch it now? You understand now why it says rend the heavens, right? Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and that you would come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. You see it now? God, remove that veil that separates heaven from us and come down to us, oh God. You see it? Now cross-reference that with Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. Let's cross-reference it again. Mark 1.10. Or let's cross-reference it now, I should say, with Mark 1.10. Rend the heavens open and come down, O God. O Jehovah, come down. Mark 1.10, and straight at coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, the heavens rendered, and the Spirit came down like a dove. Do you see it now? So now you have ample proof from Scripture. Heaven is a spiritual dimension not connected to the physical universe. In other words, it's not part of the physical universe. It is another dimension that exists side by side with the universe. And there's a veil, a door. Sorry. There's a veil, a door between this dimension called heaven and this dimension called the earth, the universe, right? So imagine there's a veil. On this side is spiritual dimension called heaven. This side is the physical creation called the universe. And all God has to do is remove the veil or open a door and you see the other side. Is that clear? Stick with the King James and don't worry about anything else as long as you understand it. Andrew Martin, not everyone's faith is little flimsy to lose it. Mightier men and women than you and I, scholastic philosophical geniuses and scientists are sold out for Jesus in love with Jesus. <clears throat> Do I need to go any further than William Lane Craig? You lost your faith, but it's only for a season, Andrew Martin. You'll come back because you have a hunger for Jesus. In fact, I'm going to share a story with Andrew Martin. Okay, Andrew, I'm going to share this story with you. I want you to go look for a case for faith. And I want you to look up Lee Strobel's interview with, <clears throat> see my his name slips. Do you guys remember the gentleman he wrote about? He was Billy Graham's mentor. Charles Templeton. True story. I heard Lee Strobel tell this to me face to face in a church and on an interview, and he mentions it. Charles Templeton was Billy Graham's mentor. He went to Princeton, lost his faith in the Bible because of liberal scholarship, and then lost his faith in God because of evil and suffering, and because he ended up, I believe, suffering with Alzheimer's. Lee Strobel heard about him. Guys, pay attention to the story. Nuxa, do me a favor. Stop engaging Andrew Martin. Focus on the topic, please. You've been engaging for the past 10 minutes, robbing him of the opportunity to hear this conversation. Stop, Nuxa. Please, focus. Now let's come back to the issue so I can talk about 1 Timothy chapter 2. Lee Strobel heard about Charles Templeton, that he was in Canada, and he was dying of Alzheimer's disease. So he went and visited him because the condition wasn't at the point where he couldn't understand. He would have his moments where he'd you know, be in and out. So he asked Charles Templeton, he asked Charles Templeton, why did you lose your faith? Read it anyway. Read, read that, Andrew Martin. And I'm not saying read it to convert. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to convert you. And you'll come back to faith. Remember my words, Andrew Martin. You'll come back stronger than ever. Just be patient. I'm patient, friend, because you're open. It's not like these militant atheists that even if God shows up in front of me, I won't believe. But coming back to Charles Templeton. Lee Strobel asked him, why did you lose your faith? And he brought up all these issues. How can a good God allow such suffering and evil? And how can a good God send people to hell? And so on and so forth. And what about all the errors in the Bible, right? In the conversation, Lee Strobel mentions, and it's actually in the documentary online. You can watch it. Watch this, guys. Listen to this. Charles Templeton stopped, looked at Lee Strobel, 
tears started coming down his eyes. See, I'm gonna get I'm gonna start crying again. As he's talking about Jesus, you know what he said? Watch here. He said, You know, I miss him. And tears came down his eyes. He goes, You know, I miss him. He was aching for Jesus. And then he wiped the tear, he goes, anyway, coming back to the subject. His art heart was aching for Jesus because he had tasted how good Jesus was. And now his life was meaningless without Jesus. And you see, Andrew Martin said it. Look, look, didn't I say it? Notice when Andrew Martin, he goes, I know that feeling. See, Andrew is in love with Jesus and he wants to believe. I promise you, Andrew, because you still love Jesus, you will come back to faith. Just be patient, Andrew. Just be patient. Just be patient, friend. Jesus is not threatened by your objections. He loves you more than you know. Now, let me tell you what happened to Charles Templeton. Okay. Charles Templeton. You guys want to hear how his life ended? You want to hear how his life ended? Lee Stovall got word that Charles Templeton died. So he called his widow and he asked her, did you read the manuscript? Because before he published the book, he sent him a pre-publication manuscript of the book. She goes, yes, I read it to him. When he was conscious, I'd read it to him. And he goes, what happened? Guys, listen to this. Listen to the story, how good Jesus is. The day he died, and this is the wife telling Lee Strobel. He goes, the day he died, he told me, don't be afraid. Angels have come to take me to heaven. I'm going home. Don't be afraid for me. And he died. Did you hear that? See, this again is going to move me in my heart. Don't be afraid. Angels have come to take me home. Don't be afraid. You know what that means? Because he ached for Jesus, Jesus did not allow him to die without restoring him. Jesus did not allow him to die without Jesus restoring him. <clears throat> he came to him. He came to him. You see how beautiful Jesus is? The Lord is not threatened by your objections. He's not threatened by your arguments. Because he's God. He's real. You can't dethrone him. And Jesus just sits there and waits patiently. I understand, son. I know you're upset. I know. I know you don't understand what's going on, but I do. And I wait patiently. And I will draw you back to myself. That's going to be Andrew Martin's story. You watch in Jesus' name. How beautiful is Jesus, huh? <clears throat> All right, let me end it with 1 Timothy 2.5. We'll do part two tomorrow. Why this passage cannot be used to undermine love life. The only fire I have is from the Holy Spirit. I pray the fire of the Holy Spirit will consume my flesh and save me. In 60 days, folks, if I don't have $40,000, the courts are going to be after me. Talk about saying attacking me. 60 days, they want 40000 They're not going to get it. I don't have it. Oh, well. I will entrust my faith to Jesus. Pray that the Lord keeps me out of jail. Anyway. Good, Stephen. I hope you keep getting tender for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Corrupt judge trying to destroy me because of corrupt lawyers. That's okay. I'm not afraid. Jesus is my God. In jail, in the gutter, homeless, he's my God. I'm not worried. Jesus is with me. I love my Lord. Just pray that he can... Continue to send me out to preach. Now, 1 Timothy 2.5. Let's look at it. I'm going to end with 1 Timothy 2.5. Yeah, that's what I'm looking into, Andrew, so pray for that. Pray God will be there for me. Okay, 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is used to show. Now, before you start stoning me, this is used to show that Mary and the saints do not intercede for you in heaven because Jesus is the one mediator, right? And I used to use this passage to prove that. Now, I'm not saying they do intercede. Okay, let me, again, be clear. Okay, I'm not saying they do intercede. I'm not saying they don't. Lord willing, I'll cover that tomorrow, okay? Corinth Chandler. I guess he's upset. I don't know. I think he's one of these uh, tools of Satan. Okay, now, medic, here we are facing fines that we cannot pay, 40000 We may even go to jail, and you're worried about your exams. But I pray in Jesus' name, medic, that Jesus blesses you, and you pass your exams 
so that you'll make enough money to send me 40,000. How about that? <laughs> How about that? I hope you pass because I'm going to expect 40,000 from you. And I hope you get it before 60 days are up. All right? Anyway, let's come back here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not saying they intercede and I'm not saying they don't. What I'm saying is 1 Timothy 2.5 was a passage I used to try to refute communion of saints, and I realized I was wrong. Okay. Now, listen to me. Please don't stone me. Does 1 Timothy 2.5 prove that because Christ is the one mediator, there is no one else interceding or mediating for us? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But it says one mediator. Okay, let's unpack it. Are you guys ready for me to unpack it? You want me there? Are you ready for me to unpack it? Okay. I want you to notice the first part of the verse. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.5. Let's read it. Guys, pay attention. If you keep texting, you're not going to be able to follow. Just pay attention. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. If Jesus being the one mediator proves there cannot be anyone else who participates in the mediation of Jesus Christ, then this passage also proves that Jesus can't be God. See, this passage proves too much. And when, when I used it to refute communion saints, I was being inconsistent because when Joe's witnesses used it to deny the Trinity, I would be quick to correct them. Okay, one more time, 1 Timothy 2.5. If you Protestants, and obviously my tradition is Protestant evangelical, are going to use this passage to prove since Christ is the one mediator and therefore no one else can share in his mediation or participate in his mediation, you're going to have to be consistent and then use that passage to prove that Jesus isn't God. <clears throat> Why do I say that? Because it says not only that Christ is the one mediator, it says there's one God that Jesus mediates before. The one God that Jesus mediates before is the Father. Therefore, if Jesus being the one mediator means there is no other who shares in his mediation, then Je Jesus <clears throat> being the mediator before the one God, means he's not the one God. The one God is other than him, and therefore Jesus can't be God. You see where I went with this? One God, and Jesus mediates before that one God, and Jesus is the one mediator. If Jesus as the one mediator means there is no one else that participates in his mediation, in union with him, then the one God that Jesus mediates before is distinct from Jesus, which means that Jesus can't be God. So you end up proving too much. You end up proving not only is there no other mediator besides Christ, but there is no other God besides the Father. So you end up with Jesus being a creature. Is that how you want to use the passage? <clears throat> is that how we want to use the passage? Because it's the same Greek word, eis or heis, if you want to use the Erasmian pronunciation. Heis, God, heis. Mesites, one mediator. Obviously, no one's going to deny that Jesus is God, even though the passage says the one God is the person that Jesus mediates before. That one God is the Father, and Jesus is distinct from him. But that doesn't mean Jesus isn't God, because we know that Jesus is one with the Father in essence. So yes, the Father is the one God, but not to the exclusion of Christ, but in union with Christ. Right? You with me there? I want to make sure you're getting it. So if the one God in that passage doesn't exclude Christ from being God, why would Jesus being the one mediator exclude others from participating in Jesus' mediation? Yes, exactly on rule. It's the same thing as John 17.3. When Jesus says the Father is the only true God, no one takes that to the exclusion of the Son if you're a Trinitarian. Now, anti-Trinitarians can be consistent. A Jehovah's Witness can tell me, yeah, Jesus isn't the one God, and there aren't no other mediators. So they can consistently say that 1 Timothy 2.5 not only proves there are no other mediators, but that Jesus isn't God because only the Father is God. So they can argue that way. But as a Trinitarian who believes in all of the Scriptures— and believe that the scriptures in their totality affirm Jesus and the Spirit are one with the Father in essence and are therefore fully God in essence and wouldn't take 1 Timothy 2.5 as an argument refuting their deity, 
then why in the world would I then be inconsistent and use the statement that Jesus is the one mediator to rule out any other person mediating in union with Christ? You understand my point? Adultery, Roy Samuel. Adultery, destroying the family. Pray that God will cause her to repent. Because you're asking, and I'm a public person, I have to be honest. Adultery with a married man. But that relationship didn't even last a year. So God have mercy on her and restore her and protect my children. Anyway, do you, you with me there? So should we use 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 to rule out the possibility that there are others in union with Christ who mediate and intercede? Should we use that passage in this manner? If we're going to be consistent with the context. So what is Paul trying to say? Paul is not saying, Paul is not saying that Jesus is the one mediated to the exclusion of others. Paul is actually teaching the opposite point. What he's trying to show is you can now intercede for others. Do you know why? Because you have one mediator before God who makes your prayers and requests acceptable to God. Paul is teaching the opposite point in 1 Timothy 2. He's actually encouraging you. Guys, do pray for the salvation of others. Do intercede for the salvation of others. You know why? Because now your intercession is acceptable because Christ makes your prayers acceptable to God because he's the one who mediates for us before God, making us pleasing to God, all the more to pray and intercede for others. That's the contextual meaning. Do you know that? We use it to prove the opposite point that Paul is trying to make. Paul is not saying, oh, Jesus, one mediator, no mediators. Don't, no, he's saying, guys, don't you know that when you pray and supplicate and intercede, God hears you because of your love for Jesus, because of your union with Jesus, because you're one with Jesus in the spirit, you're his spiritual body. And because Jesus mediates for you, he makes your prayers pleasing to God. So your prayers are now heard because he's your mediator. You understand the point now? Can I prove to you that's the meaning contextually? Well, Roy, you keep praying for me that God preserves me for his glory. Are you paying attention? You Protestants, stop using this passage to teach something it wasn't meant to teach. Now let me prove it to you. Let's read 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 6 in context. Let's read it. Then I'll do part 2 on communion of saints. I hope you're blessed today. God willing, we'll do part two tomorrow. Okay. First to me, two, one to six. Guys, please read now. Read, please. I exhort, therefore, I encourage you that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, bam. He starts off the chapter by encouraging, exhorting Christians, supplicate, intercede, giving thanks for all men that be made from. So, Pray for all men. Pray for their salvation. Intercede for them, especially for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Did you see what the contextual meaning is? He's telling you, intercede for the salvation of all men especially those in authority because you have one mediator who offered himself as a ransom to make you acceptable and pleasing to god so that now when you pray for others god will hear you because jesus mediates and makes your prayers acceptable you with me there So why would I then use 1 Timothy 2, 5 to undermine the contextual meaning of Paul? Why would I use to prove there are no mediators, intercessors, when in the context he says it right after saying, you Christians, I exhort you, make supplications, intercessions for all men, especially those in power, because God wants all men to be saved, right? 
because there's only one God for all people. So there's only one God who can save anyone. And now there's a mediator that stands between God and men so that God will save people on the basis of that one mediator. And your prayers will be heard because of reunion with that one mediator. That's Paul's point. But we're not turning his argument upside down to teach something he didn't mean to teach. So you see why 1 Timothy 2.5 is misused and abused by us Protestant evangelicals? So I exhort you, if you love the Bible and you love truth and you love God and not your tradition, whether you're Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, put aside your tradition and let the Bible speak and let 1 Timothy 2.5 mean what it says and don't make it say something it wasn't meant to say. You with me there? Don't read this text as a Protestant or a Catholic or an Orthodox. Read it the way Paul wanted you to read it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't make this passage say something that Paul didn't intend it to say. If you're going to keep insisting there's one mediator and there's no other, then be consistent. There's only one God. That's the Father. There is no other. And Jesus is in God. But none of you are going to argue that way. No, I don't believe Jesus is saying that we unregenerate Ninevites will get our land now. What Jesus is referring to is when he sets up his reign on earth and glorified Assyrians, born of the Spirit, transformed by his grace, will be ruling Nineveh as Christ's representatives on earth. That's what he means. Yeah, right? So I hope you got your answer. New wine, you're going to have to wait for part two about communion of saints. But let me give you a teaser for what's to come. Okay, tomorrow, God willing, I'll go into But let me, can I give you a teaser for what's to come tomorrow? Yeah, exactly, first and last. Let's be ortho catholo estent. And let's be pan millennialists. It'll all pan out at the end. Now, let me whet your appetites and give you a teaser for tomorrow, God willing. You ready? For tomorrow, God willing, in Jesus' name, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Al Ruhul, did you like my exegesis? What's baffling to you, Andrew? What's baffling to you? Here's a foretaste of tomorrow, and I got to go. Okay. Luke 16, 28 to 31. Luke 16, 28 to 30, 31. It's okay, Maria P. Keep listening. You'll understand one day. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, I'm only human. Asher's just a woman. No, anyway. Luke 16, 20 to 31, 31. Thank you, Paul Bullis. May God hear your prayer. Brother Paul, there is one in mind. I have one in sight. Can you pray for me that God will show me if she's the one, if not to protect me, not to make this mistake again? Luke 16, 28 to 31. Thank you for that prayer, brother, because that is, I am lonely, but Jesus is good, and he has one for me, and I just patient on the Lord. Let's read, guys. This is Abraham speaking to the rich man in the afterlife. This is the afterlife. For I have five brethren. He's asking Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers on earth, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Guys, pay attention to Abraham's answer. Luke 16, 29. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Your brothers on earth have Moses and the prophets. Now let's read 30 to 31. And he said, Nay, Father. No, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now watch Abraham, folks. Guys, listen. Stop the texting because I want to sh shock you. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, the one rise from the dead. Question. How did Abraham know that the people on earth had the writings of Moses and the prophets when Moses and the prophets came centuries after him and their books were collected centuries after his death. How did he know that? How did he know that? Your brothers on earth have the writings of Moses and the prophets. Let them read the writings of Moses and the prophets. Abraham, how did you know they had the Old Testament? 
That was written after you died. How do you know they have a collection of books written by Moses and the prophets? Did you did you catch it or no? You went silent. Well, he was in the afterlife. He wasn't in Christ's heavenly presence, not yet. Yeah, and by the way, do hit the smash, uh, the, the like button, so we can get, you know, the page up and rolling. Now, Revelation 5.13, and then I'm going to give you more tomorrow. There's more tomorrow, folks. This is just to whet your appetite. Yep, you got it, Alex. Revelation 5.13. Relation 513. Well, Bill Thompson, he wasn't in a glorified state yet. He was in a disembodied state in a dimension of rest, but he hadn't entered the presence of Christ in heaven yet. That was after Jesus' ascension. But still, he's in the afterlife. Now, Revelation 513, guys, read with me. Pay attention. Revelation 513. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth. Notice, John sees every creature in the entire creation. Every creature in heaven, on earth under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them every creature everywhere heard i saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever guys here's a question how did john how was john able to hear every creature in all creation praising god and the lamb He said, I heard every creature everywhere praising God and Lamb, and even hears what they said to God and the Lamb. How could he hear every creature in existence when he's not omnipresent, omniscient? Yep, Alan Ruhl's right. He's now in heaven before the throne. Yes, DHS. The veil was removed so that he could see the entire creation without having to be omnipresent or omniscient. So that's another bad argument we Protestants use. Well, to be able to hear multiple prayers, you got to be omniscient. No, you don't. It only requires God being omniscient and God making it known to you, this person is asking such and such. And this is to whet your appetite for tomorrow, part two. Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Right? So... Look for me tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for part two. Guys, pray for me. Pray Jesus makes me pure and holy, saves me from my flesh. Pray the Lord helps me to get my health. Pray Jesus fights my children, protects them from irreparable damage because of a broken home, and convict their mother to repent. And guys, again, I'm going to let you know, within 60 days, this corrupt judge expects me to come up with $40,000. I'm not coming up with it because it's $40,000 for her attorney fees that she accrued. She wants me to pay her attorney $40,000. Don't have it. Won't do it. I need a miracle that Jesus will now save me from this corrupt, wicked, satanic judgment and continue to use me for his glory. I don't even make $40,000 a year to come up with $40,000 in, in 60 days. Satan. Susan, that's because Satan is attacking me. But the blood of Jesus is greater still. So pray for me, all right? Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Hit the, the like button. Pass this recording on, hear it again, use the arguments for the glory of Jesus. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Have mercy on us, Son of God. God bless you guys. See you tomorrow, Lord willing. Same bad time, same bad channel. Fat man. And do pray for that godly woman to come into my life. I have one in mind. Let's see what the Lord says. Let me do this. Okay, before I go, let me show you. I'm getting my muscles back. Don't hate. See that AD? I'm getting my muscles back, sucker. All right, take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.